Now it's a pleasure for me to welcome Professor Harry Manoharan from Stanford University. Manoharan obtained his PhD degree at Princeton University. For his postdoc, he went to the famous scanning tunneling microscopy group of Don Eigler at IBM Almaden. He was there involved in building atomic structures atom by atom on a metallic surface using atomic manipulation in a scanning tunneling microscope. Manoharan is since 2001 at Stanford and still uses atomic man manipulation to build quantum matter. The title of his lecture will be uh, Designer Quantum Matter and I would like to welcome Harry to the floor. Okay, thank you very much. You, you heard in the introduction that you will, in this journey you will be traveling long distances through the hallways on your way to other talks afterwards. So I wanted to point out from the beginning and counterpoint, I'll be talking about very small distances in this, in this talk. So it's a talk about small things. And I, my goal is hopefully by the end of this talk to just give you some flavor of what we believe is a new frontier in science and technology. It's the creation and study of designer quantum matter. Uh, what is this stuff? Okay, I'll be talking about experiments. Uh, what we're doing now is taking the, the essential building blocks of matter as we know it, the atoms, molecules, and the nuclei and the electrons within them, and piecing them together in new and exciting ways, uh, creating new materials. They have often exotic properties, perhaps something that we target. In some cases, things that we didn't uh, seek, but uh, just came out, they emerged. Uh, um, and uh, we discovered them in, uh, in the process of doing the experiments. So, uh, and any of these materials, we can even synthesize new quantum particles. So I'll give you some, uh, some flavor of that as well. So there's a, a, a lot that I just said there. So I want to, uh, and we'll get to uh, some of the highlights in this talk, but let me, I wanted to start simple. There's going to be a lot of images so we're fortunate we have a lot of images that I can show you because, as you heard, uh, this data, the data that I'll show you is taken primarily by scanning tunneling microscopes. And uh, there's two data sets that I put up here on the screen. And I mentioned starting simple because even if you're not an expert, you've probably heard of graphene. Graphene, honeycomb lattice, a two-dimensional material, just one atom thick. These two images are of graphene. But one is real graphene, meaning natural, built of carbon atoms, extracted from a three-dimensional graphite material, and there's one layer of atoms that we've imaged. And the other is, in some sense, artificial. However, it's still made out of atoms, electrons, molecules, the same ingredients, pieced together in a different way. We call it molecular graphene, an artificial form of graphene. I could ask you to, to tell me which one is real and which one is fake, or which one is real and which one is our, our designer material. Um, there would, I think, uh, there would, there would, you would have a 50-50 chance of just from looking at these images and guessing which, which, is, uh, which is which. So I will, I will just tell you that on the left is real graphene. I haven't put the length scales there on purpose, but these are similar length scales. There's atomic, si atomic distances that you're seeing up there. And on the right is this uh, new material I'll get to called molecular graphene. Okay. So that's a, maybe a simple example of uh, designer quantum matter. Let me start with a, at, at a big picture. I mentioned small length scales. I think also many of you have heard of this famous speech in the past, so I'm now going back, uh, in, going back a little to uh, 1959. Uh, the speech given by Richard Feynman called, uh, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And I put a, a little excerpt from this speech up, up here, because it's quite prophetic and is a good way to start. Basically, you can read it here, but to paraphrase Feynman, what he's saying is, at the time, 1959, Knowing the laws of physics, as they were known then, he was saying, I don't think there's any laws of physics that would prevent us from manipulating matter all the way down to the bottom. And he used those words, at the bottom. 
How much room is there at the bottom? Well, we could, why can't we just manipulate the atoms, put them where we want them, and then imagine, that's what he says, what would happen if we can arrange the atoms the way we want them, okay? Not necessarily the way nature puts them together, but the way we want them, one by one. So, this is quite prophetic. At the time, there was not even knowledge of how to build the tools that could possibly do this kind of manipulation. In fact, if we fast forward from the speech, it took, it was only, it was several decades later that one of the primary tools that we use in our lab still today that you heard about, the scanning tunneling microscope was invented, okay? Um, but even at this time, the electron microscope didn't exist. So the uh, prophetic in many ways, um, I want to now fast forward to present day and our experiments, and I'm gonna show you a video um, I'll describe all the components of this in a minute, but just let me point out some of the highlights. Okay, so this piece of designer material that I showed at the opening called molecular graphene, here's a movie of its creation in our lab. So you see some things moving around, something being pieced together, and hopefully a honeycomb lattice is evident and emerging. So I point out the the length scale here, down here, is five nanometers, 10 to the minus nine meters. And I'll let this uh, play again. The other features I want to point out are things that might look like noise in this images. In fact, as you see, they emerge as wave patterns. And there's also things that look like black dots, particles. It turns out these are mole uh, single molecules in this case. Um, and what I would say, if you just look at this picture here, or any of these images, there's really textbook pictures of wave particle duality. All those black dots, single molecules, are fixed in place. They effectively have very high mass, they're very heavy, so we image them as particles. There's electrons on the surface of this material, it's a metal. Those electrons are delocalized, they're not bound, they have relatively light mass, and as a result, we see them not as particles, but as waves. So in one picture, it's wave particle duality. Um, and this is, uh, is also what makes these experiments exciting. Every time we look at these materials close up, uh, we're actually just visualizing quantum mechanics, a lot of the abstract things that you learn about in class, all the way back um, as an undergrad in physics. Uh, we can now see and, and, and uh, play with, manipulate. A lot of these experiments are actually motivated by things that uh, d kind of disturbed me as I went through classes. I didn't believe or just didn't make any sense, and it's, it's just, uh, it's really fun every day to play, just uh, reach out and touch quantum mechanics. So, as I mentioned, I'll go through some details, but let me, so everyone is on the same page, uh, say a bit about the scanning tunneling microscope. So, a cartoon is up here. The, we have a, sh we have a tip, we have a surface or a sample that we want to probe, we bring this tip to within atomic distances of the surface, very close but not touching. Um, close enough so that we can pass a quantum mechanical current of electrons between the tip and uh, the surface. Okay? So that distance that actually has to be on order, it's to scale here, on order of the atomic diameter. The STM is a brilliant example of taking a gift from nature, turning it around, and uh, making an, an incredibly new tool. This gift from nature is the quantum mechanical tunneling law. It didn't have to work out this way, but when you put in all the constants for real materials, it works out that this current of electrons that, that basically tunnels through this vacuum barrier here is exponentially sensitive on that distance. And the numbers work out so that if you just change that distance by one angstrom, okay, about the size of an atom, then the current changes by a factor of 10. So nature has given us this incredible and very powerful uh, large uh, amplifier of tiny distances through uh, the tunneling law, and the STM basically uses that to measure in reverse very, very small distances. So uh, the scanning part is that you can take this tip, monitor this current, and move it across the surface in a raster pattern. You can monitor the current or monitor the tip height, and there's different ways you can operate this, this microscope. But because we're amplifying tiny distances, even the distance between you know, the top of the, an atom and the hollow between it can easily be read off. 
okay? If, as long as you isolate your system from other vibration that might prevent you from seeing this, seeing this signal. So that's the essence of the STM. In our lab, we have uh, several of these apparatus that are built from scratch, although you can buy STMs now commercially. And there's all kinds of families of scanning probes, as many of you know and may use. The, I show a, a picture of some of our instruments. So this is uh, a picture from our, our, our lab, which is in the sub-basement and therefore vi uh, isolated from vibration. Um, and I'll just mention, I, so I mentioned before that we have to isolate from, from different kinds of noise. Noise is present not only in vibration, but also acoustic noise, so people talking, we have sound, so we have soundproof chambers. And uh, just temperature is a source of noise through thermal vibrations. So we often do low temperature, use low temperature to get rid of the, the thermal noise as well. So how low, we, we typically do experiments at 4 Kelvin at liquid helium temperature or, or below. Um, because we're accessing different quantum systems, sometimes we apply a magnetic field. But what I want to uh, get to at the very end of this talk is a way of applying very large magnetic fields to materials without a magnet of any kind, if you can believe that. In fact, we've gotten up to 300 Tesla apply a field applied uh, to, a, to, a, to a system, one of our designer materials, uh, without a magnet. And this is a field that, in fact, is not possible to create with a static magnet presently. So, the, uh, I'll, and then I'll say one, one word here about the distance. I mentioned small distances. So, if you look through this, I'll point out that one distance scale there is down to femtometers. Femtometer, 10 to the minus 15 meters. So, this is now the resolution of our best imaging apparatus. You might ask, so this is many orders of magnitude smaller than an atom. You might ask, why, why do we even need this resolution? The answer is that we're looking at things, typically now, much smaller than atoms. What are they? Well, there's, this is of the order of the size of a nucleus. We can actually access now some of the nuclear properties, like the nuclear mass inside atoms. And we're looking and directly imaging the quantum wave functions of the electrons. So I showed you those an example in that first picture. And for this, this resolution is, is very critical. Now, if you have this high resolution, then just imaging materials um, is, gives you a, a very pretty picture of nature, looking at something, a material close up, even a common material like copper. This is shown here. Uh, it looks very beautiful. So these are. This is a gallery of images uh, to show you that the two in the center happen to be high temperature superconductors. There's a larger picture of real graphene there. Um, and what I'll talk about today is based on actually these two images on the left and the right. Uh, simple material, copper, looks very intriguing when you look at it close up. And again, I'll point out this. Here again is a close, another picture, wave particle duality, just, just a copper surface. Um, these, you see things that might uh, look like noise to you, but if you look harder, there's actually some periodicity here, and these are wave patterns. Those are the quantum mechanical uh, waves of electrons on the surface. We could say they're standing waves, like ripples in a pond. And uh, underneath that is a regular lattice, which turns out to be the copper lattice, the copper atoms, and the copper crystal, okay, underneath these electrons. So again, in one picture, wave particle duality, the copper's atoms are locked into place, have a high mass, are localized, and therefore image as particles, and the electrons are delocalized, completely free to move uh, image as waves. The, um, uh, when I describe, I will describe shortly how we manipulate, uh, how we actually get to manipulation beyond imaging, and uh, this is where this, this other image comes in. So let me start, let me go there now and talk about this manipulation process that you heard about. Manipulation, manipulating atoms, electrons, molecules, and so forth, in one, one quantum entity at a time. So the, you've, uh, what can you do if you can move atoms around? Well, this whole field, in a way, did start with Don Eigler, as you heard, and, uh, and that start was essentially a form of atomic graffiti. Right, the famous IBM logo spelled out in uh, spelled out in atoms. So what I want to show you is that we've hopefully gone a little bit further 
past atomic graffiti, although last night in the class I, show, I showed a form of graffiti which is uh, writing with electrons, not uh, even smaller than atoms. And this uh, slide here is basically, this first row is a before picture and an after picture at increasing length scales, going down very small, uh, that leftmost image, 25 angstroms, going up to 150 angstroms in size, before and after doing different experiments in, uh, in our lab where these uh, numbers at the bottom represent the, numbers, the, the number of atoms or molecules manipulated to create those structures. Okay. We, the materials I'm going to be talking about today are far to the right on this scale, um, consisting of thousands up to about 1,500 uh, single atoms or, or, uh, mo or uh, molecules. Okay. So, the other component of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, is graphene. I'll just say a little bit uh, about introduct a little bit, a few words of introduction on graphene. So, graphene is a, is a, is a two-dimensional carbon lattice. Um, picture was shown before on a small and large scale. We uh, often s look at this in real space and also in momentum space. Momentum space image is shown on the right. The, the salient point in this uh, image on the right are these sh sharp cone-like structures called Dirac cones. They're very much like light cones uh, that you might also be familiar with, but these are uh, like light cones for electrons that exist inside this material. And in a nutshell, what's going on and the ex excitement around graphene stems from the fact that instead of the Schrodinger equation, the electrons obey the Dirac equation or an effective form of the Dirac equation inside graphene. The Dirac equation is an equation describing relativistic particles. And as it's written here, they're massless. So if you took a particle without mass, in vacuum it moves at the speed of light. In these materials, the electrons move as if they have no mass, and the speed of light is replaced with what's uh, written here as a Fermi velocity. VF, but otherwise the equation is the same. So this means that graphene is essentially a way to do high energy physics in condensed matter. So this is uh, partially uh, behind the excitement of graphene. There's a lot of technology that you can base on this. So the, just like high energy particles are chiral, um, you can, they either, this Dirac equation creates a symmetry where either the spin of the particle has to be aligned or anti-aligned with its direction of motion. Uh, as shown here, the electrons in graphene are chiral in the same way. Okay. So <clears throat> another picture I can show you is, uh, is the following. The, this is a picture of, of the Dirac equation. You have Dirac equation allows both positive and negative energies, right? So, if a particle has a mass, that mass, mass energy is mc squared, and so there's a gap of twice that between the particles and the antiparticles, antiparticles being negative energy particles. If you shrink that mass to zero, the spectrum looks something like this, um, and the Dirac equation there, those particles move at the speed of light. If we take this to graphene, the uh, mapping is that the particles are become electrons, the antiparticles become the lack of electrons or holes in the sample, and now you can also, the same language is used for semiconductors, and now we have this burgeoning class of new materials we call Dirac materials that uh, started with graphene. We have other new materials now like topological insulators um, that also are Dirac materials. The equation is the same except for uh, just a, a renormalization of this, the effective speed of light. Okay, and so the and, and to give you also another baseline here, uh, an example of uh, the t for real particles, the Dirac equation in vacuum is a, would be a neutrino that has no mass. And uh, what, we t what we call these electrons inside graphene are so-called massless Dirac fermions. Okay, the other part of uh, this picture is that it's only in recent years that now a, a, uh, a class of uh, at least four or five different types of experiments have emerged to create artificial Dirac materials that we can tune in various ways. These are ordered on this slide and from small to large. 
We're, what I'll talk about today is this left, uh, our experiments here. You can, you can look up and uh, describe in some of these papers at the bottom. Um, don't worry about these numbers. The, um, the experiments here, on the two on the left are actually in real condensed matter. The two on the right involve optics and uh, are, are larger in scale and in some ways are more simulation of uh, condensed matter. So I'll be talking about real condensed matter um, at very small length scales to do this. And the, what we do, as you have hopefully got some glimpse of from those images and movies, is first to, to create these, these materials, these new materials. We control the structure down to the level of atoms. We use those atoms uh, to sculpt the potential, uh, something that we design uh, ahead of time, and then that potential then guides the electrons. We can also control the quantum mechanical phase of those electrons as they move through the system. And uh, some of the applications uh, I'll men I mentioned before is to create these, these so-called gauge fields or, or pseudo fields. These can be electric fields or magnetic fields, I mentioned. So the uh, kind of a picture outline of uh, what I want to show you uh, in, the, in the remainder of this talk is shown here. We compare with theory, and a nice thing about graphene is that the theory is very simple. In fact, it's, in, it's used in textbooks uh, for people uh, learning, when you learn quantum mechanics that you want to apply quantum mechanics knowledge to material, you can do a very simple calculation. It's called tight binding. Um, this is used by uh, physicists and chemists to describe a material, and that's in this top row. Graphene has a textbook, uh, has a, a textbook uh, real space image, the honeycomb lattice, but um, it also has a, a, a distinctive electronic signature, which is shown here. This is what uh, I'm plotting here, the density of states. It's called the density of states of the electrons of uh, graphene. And on the bottom row is our experiment, snapshots from our from our data, and one way that we have of testing whether we're doing what we think we're doing is just comparing to this simple theory. And you can see here just by eye, things match up pretty well. So that's bare graphene. Our intent was not to just replicate graphene, but it was to go beyond graphene in ways that uh, are, not, are not possible yet. Uh, in, some, in some cases, may never be possible with real graphene. So two milestones that I'll describe are taking those massless Dirac fermions and then uh, basically modifying them and embedding a mass, okay, adding a mass to them. And uh, finally, I will uh, come to creating a Hall effect with the magnetic field that we apply to the system, but this is done, as I mentioned, without a magnet, and it's done by actually controlling the phase of the electrons in, uh, in a new way. So, Part of these uh, experiments were motivated by uh, previous work that we've done manipulating phase of electrons and crafting uh, new uh, patterns, uh, new structures of electronic structure. Uh, this, this is one, uh, one thing I talked about last night in a master class we call quantum holography. This experiment, we basically wrote, so this is back to graffiti, we wrote tiny letters but in electrons. So imagine taking the orbital or wave function of an electron in an atom and somehow reshaping it into a letter or putting in bits in, inside that wave function. This is an example of doing it in a kind of a picturesque way. So we just used letters that you can recognize immediately that are comprised of bits. But to do this, we had to uh, make a tiny hologram, an atomic sized hologram with molecules on a surface. And that crafted what we call a three-dimensional electronic object of our design, in this case, holding letters or the bits that made those letters. After this experiment, we realized if we're, if we're just making our own electronic structure, um, let, this means that we're, we can uh, apply this at a large scale to new materials that have our own tailor-made properties in electronic structure. So this is what led in, in, uh, uh, to these experiments. Uh, the, Real graphene that I showed at the beginning is shown here. This is our artificial form, molecular graphene. Looks almost the same, but here's the, uh, here's the physics behind it, the simple physics. So if you wanted to create a, an artificial form of graphene, you want some kind of honeycomb network, and you want to put electrons 
into the corners of the honeycomb. Okay, that's what graphene does. There are carbon atoms in the corners of this honeycomb. So one way you could do that is you could put down some electrodes and you could make those electrodes uh, attract ele electrons underneath them in the and put them down in, a, in an arrangement of a honeycomb. Okay. As it turns out, if we're, I'm gonna, we're talking about manipulating atoms and electrons, in our practice, atoms and electrons are not, on the surface, are not attractive to electrons, but they're repulsive. Now consider this in this drawing here. If I put down these red dots and they repelled electrons, then in some sense, uh, the red dots being repulsive and these white dots being attractive or equivalent. They have a connection. If I, if I draw lines between these red dots, I get a triangular lattice instead of a honeycomb. But the point is electronically, uh, they're identical. Okay, they, send, they both send electrons to the same place, to the corners of a honeycomb lattice. Um, this, these lattices are actually called dual. You can see they're inverse lattices. And uh, this is how we design our system. If we, want, uh, if we want graphene, we create the dual lattice with atoms. Okay, and so those will be arranged in a triangular lattice. Okay, so here's, an, here's a magnified view of the actual data of how we do this. And so now what you should consider is that in real graphene, our carbon atoms would be in these corners. Okay, in our case, these black dots are car single carbon monoxide molecules, and the corners actually are little what we call quantum dots. They're reservoirs for electrons that are quantized, and they play the role of the atoms. And in fact, if you design this right, then you can induce or allow quantum tunneling between these quantum dots, and they image directly on our STM as a little line that's connecting them because there's some probability of finding the electrons between them. So that's essentially an artificial chemical bond. After all, a chemical bond to physicists is just uh, uh, some, uh, it's just part of a wave function or some probability of finding an electron between the sites. So that's our artificial graphene. And I will say a little bit uh, of what we call the band structure graphene, uh, which, is, which is shown, or how we motivate this in our sample. Um, what's shown there is energy versus momentum a common way of visualizing the band structure of uh, materials. And on the left, I'm show you the, uh, where, the location of the carbon monoxide molecules. Imagine now there's zero potential. Those carbon monoxide molecules are doing nothing. But as I ramp up the potential, how repulsive they are, and increase that, then these bands move around. One of them splits off, and I'm left with a band structure that, if you know anything, if you have studied graphene, you will recognize. This is a prototype band structure for graphene. This crossing point here is exactly that Dirac cone that I showed at the beginning, okay? So the other final ingredient here is, to, for this building, is that we need a building material, right? So our, we have a, it's like building a house. You need your land, it's hopefully flat, so we try, we start here with uh, copper 111 as I showed before. These are different terraces that are flat, good building places, but we need our bricks to build, so we put down, uh, our, we dose some molecules on the surface. In this case, those black dots are individual molecules. If I expand them, it looks like this. And the reason why these this is CO, right, two atoms, but it image, they image as a circle because they actually stand straight up on the surface. So we're viewing these from the top. They're circularly symmetric. A detail is they image as little depressions in the surface in spite of the fact that they stick out. This has to do with the fact that they're repulsive potentials, okay? So now finally the last step is the manipulation. How do we do this? Uh, this uh, physically, what, what goes between those images I showed, the before and after pictures. We have an, an ad atom on the surface or a molecule. We form a tunable bond with the tip by physically moving the tip in close enough to essentially uh, you know, almost reach out and pick up a single molecule, but to balance the forces between uh, the attraction of this uh, ad atom onto the tip and the bonds that hold it on the surface. And I'll show you what, what this looks like for an actual carbon monoxide molecule. This manipulation process looks like this. A tip comes in. We do this under computer control. We move this molecule, these molecules one at a time to a new location. This is what's 
this manipulation process is uh, something we can do with uh, almost 100% yield. And the, this is what now uh, is, uh, I've explained now is what's behind this movie. Okay, so that's in between frames, we're doing that manipulation process on these, um, on these individual carbon monoxide molecules. Those are what you see as the black dots. And we're guiding the electron. You see they're going into a triangular lattice, as I explained. And we're guiding the electrons, therefore, into a honeycomb lattice. And now the question is, is this really graphene? And what can we do with it? Okay. Here's another visualization of this, of this uh, graphene lattice. This is a calculation. You can see the individual carbon monoxide molecules that we're manipulating with our, with our tip to create this lattice. And uh, this is a calculated uh, uh, trajectory, quantum trajectory of a particle, an electron, through this lattice. Before it reaches this, uh, this electron reaches the artificial or molecular graphene, it's moving straight ahead, and this particle has mass because it's moving in this normal electron gas on the surface of copper. As it enters graphene, it suddenly and magically loses that mass. It becomes a new particle, a Dirac fermion. So it switches from obeying Schrodinger equation to this Dirac equation, loses its mass. It can hear this trajectory shown bouncing around a plaquette. It can tunnel between sites, and it can actually leave, uh, move through graphene and, and leave it on the other side. So as I mentioned, our way of testing whether this is graphene is not just to look at it, because it looks like graphene, but to test this electronically. And the way we do that is by measuring the, de the so-called density of states. Okay? Experimentally, what we measure is a conductance. We have, we, measure, we have a quantum tunneling current. We can change its voltage. The ratio of these is a conductance. That's what's plotted on the y-axis versus voltage. This gives us, this is our experimental measurement of density of states. And we can just compare this to what should be expected theoretically, the so-called tight binding calculation I mentioned, which is shown in the dotted line. And even before that calculation, if you, you might recognize the, the spectrum. If you didn't know it, you could calculate it, compare, and you see it's very good fidelity. This is indeed graphene band structure. And we can get all the parameters, the relevant parameters, uh, uh, out of this. For example, the strength of the tunneling between the bonds and so forth. So indeed, we have, we've synthesized now from scratch these, these Dirac particles and these, and the, uh, Dirac cones and the massless particles that inhabit them. Uh, here's another direct measurement of this Dirac cone. What we're tunneling into different sites, they're labeled A and B here. Um, the, the horizontal axis here is just the same density of states, and uh, vertical axis energy, and you can see that the dependence is linear. We can just draw a line through there. That line, the slope of this line, this is, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the tunneling through the other site. They cross, has the same slope. This is a visualization of the Dirac cone. And the slope, as we read it off, is exactly uh, the effective speed of light of these particles inside the material. So uh, if, this, if these were light, this would be a light cone, then that slope would give you C, the speed of light. Here we see the, uh, the effective speed of light we call the Fermi velocity, which is written up there, which is, several, uh, which is much smaller than the speed of light, a few orders of magnitude. Um, this is also an interesting thing because if we're doing something like a high energy that's uh, the equivalent of a high-energy physics experiment inside our material. The fact that these electrons actually move a lot slower makes the experiments a lot easier to do. Okay, so what else can we do with this graphene? I'll give you, um, I mentioned uh, two things. Modifying the bonds locally, that's what I want to talk about next. Uh, we can, this is very difficult to do in real graphene, but here we can just reach out and touch and, and uh, jiggle things around and actually texture this material in profound ways. So I'll, I'll uh, describe a couple of different things here we can do. A, a very simple thing we can do is to just take this lattice and expand the whole lattice or shrink it. Okay, so that's changing the whole size of everything uh, uniformly. This has an interesting effect. So that's called the lattice parameter, or this, the periodicity of the lattice, its distance. So we can adjust this lattice parameter, the size of this, uh, of this graphene, 
to have a band structure that looks like this, sorry, a density of states that looks like this, uh, where this, uh, the, where this, uh, this depression sits is the Dirac point, so-called Dirac point. And the fact that it's at zero energy means that this is a, this is a neutral form of graphene. There's just as many electrons as there are uh, holes. And the, <clears throat> an interesting thing that happens is when we change the size, either shrink it or expand it, it shifts this density of states, either left or right. And that if, what that means is this is our handle for either adding electrons into this Dirac cone or subtracting them and therefore creating holes. So for those of you familiar with semiconductor physics, in semiconductor physics, this would be called doping the material, changing it to be n-type or p-type, alternately neutral. Here, we're doing it just by shrinking and expanding the lattice. So this gives us a way of making some interesting, actually, technology. PN junctions, for example, diodes or transistors, by piecing these regions together. Um, there's some more exotic things you can do with PN junctions, something we've been working on for a long time. This actually on the left is an experiment I did at uh, IBM called the Quantum Mirage. It's essentially a, you could look at it as a type of lens. In this case, we lens some electronic structure, um, a, uh, the condo effect or some mag magnetization from one focus of an ellipse to the other using quantum waves. So kind of a, a closed lens. There's now predictions that you can make an open lens or a so-called perfect lens or vasilago lens by using the properties of graphene by sandwiching together uh, N and P-type regions. So rays that diverge on one side will naturally converge on the other side to a focus without any other external structure. These all require PN junctions, which is something now that we've, we've built with very high fidelity. Here's an example. Here's a P-type uh, region of molecular graphene and its measured spectrum, followed by, sandwiched by an N-type region, followed by a P-type region. So we can confirm, in fact, there's an excess of holes in the left side, electrons in the center, holes on the right side. So this is like a PNP transistor geometry, very tiny. Um, we wanted to see how, how, uh, how quickly do the electronic properties change across these interfaces here. And this is a measure of how good this, uh, um, how sharp these interfaces are electronically. And so we, I show you a, a picture of the density of states as we go across, we scan across this. And maybe you can just look at this white line, which is showing the Dirac, the, locate, the energy of the Dirac point. It goes up to down to up. That's P, N, P. And uh, you can see that it changes in the data basically only uh, over a single atomic site. So that's basically as sharp as you can make this transition. It's impossible to do with real graphene, where you would use gates that are proximate to the surface. And uh, it's... Uh, it's allowing us now to make uh, very precise, electronically controlled uh, junctions. All right, the, back to some now even, even more exotic physics here. So you've all heard of uh, the Higgs particle and the Higgs, the Higgs boson. There's basically, you may have heard that there's, uh, it's, uh, there's a mass associated with it, and this is how it was uh, measured. Um, and this, uh, there's a field actually associated with, uh, with uh, Higgs that gives mass to massless relativistic particles. What I'm going to show you here is, a, is an essentially an, an analog of this Higgs field built into graphene. The way we did this is implementing what's called a Kekulé distortion. Kekulé, uh, in 1865, gave the original theory of benzene, which we now know is wrong. However, the quantum version of it is correct. Basically, what these two static pictures of the dimerized bonds, uh, superposition of those is what's going on in benzene. However, you can build a static version of that into graphene. You can dimerize the bonds and make a pattern like is shown here uh, in the middle. We do it by decorating the surface and arranging these little triangles or chevrons of uh, arrangements of carbon monoxide molecules to alternately uh, pinch off bonds. So in this case, you'll see, if you go around a plaquette, 
you see a weak bond, strong, weak, strong, weak, just like, uh, Kek uh, just like Kekulé's drawing here. And you can repeat this through the lattice. Theoretically, this is well known to, as a way of create, without breaking the essential symmetry graphene of adding a mass. Okay. And the picture is shown here. A mass, remember that original picture where we have mc squared, or 2mc squared is a mass if we take Dirac equation, right? So that's what should happen uh, in this. We look at those Dirac points on the right, and the Dirac point will now uh, be uh, split by an energy gap, which is twice mc squared. Okay. So we, uh, we did this in experiment. And our way of measuring this gap is, again, to measure the density of states. The gap is very clear. Here it goes, where density of states goes to zero for some finite energy region. We can read off that gap, and it's around a tenth of uh, tenth the mass of an electron. So this is the, the new mass that we've now endowed onto these um, previously massless Dirac fermions. Okay. And so it's, that's like, uh, it's, and the connection to Higgs is, uh, is more detailed. I don't have time to explain it more, but um, uh, I will just go on and show you my final, uh, the final topic here, which is the magnetic fields I alluded to at the beginning. There was a, a theoretical proposal uh, by uh, Paco Ganea and collaborators uh, proposing something that sounded just impossible, that by straining graphene, you could induce incredibly strong built-in magnetic fields, so strong that the electrons would actually form cyclotron orbits, and the quantized version of those are called Landau levels, as if you were applying a large magnetic field. But yet, all that was involved is straining this material. So the calculations were pretty clear. They're shown over here. This is one of those examples, one crazy thing that we saw that we realized, well, this would be crazy if it worked, but we, had, we were in a position to try it. And I'll show you the results of that experiment, because of course we can, we can impart any kind of strain we want to these designer materials. So back to graphene. This is the unstrained version. On, on the bottom, I'm showing the theoretical field that would exist um, if we strained it by varying amounts. So this is, would be a 15 Tesla field, a 30 Tesla field, strain it some more, 45, strain it some more, 60 Tesla. So I'm just showing you images now. Uh, without proof yet that there is some kind of magnetic field. Again, the way to test whether this is truly a magnetic field is look at the spectrum of electrons. So let me show you that, those results. Um, this is without strain and enlargement of the center. This is with the highest strain. Uh, you'll notice some symmetry breaking I'll mention uh, in a minute. But we take the spectrum, and from, from bottom to top, we're increasing the strain. Uh, and the results of the spectrum, based the, the net result, you should see that we have a graphene-like spectra here, and we start seeing these uh, more and more wiggles in the spectrum. As it turns out, if you piece those together with the theory, those wiggles correspond to Landau levels, the quantized cyclotron orbits of electrons in this material. So indeed, we confirmed that these, ele these electrons don't care whether this is a real magnet or a fake magnet that we've embedded and essentially embedded a fake magnet by strain into the system. They behave exactly the same. So, you know, if, again, if you're familiar with semiconductor physics, you've heard of built-in electric fields through PN junctions. Here, we're building in a huge magnetic field into this material without a magnet. Now we're up to three, this is 60 Tesla, we're up to 300 Tesla. You can imagine now we've combined electric and magnetic fields. The electric fields don't require gates. They're just done with shrinking, expanding the lattice in various ways. And the magnetic fields don't require a physical magnet. They just require moving the atoms around in a little bit more complex way. Okay. So um, you, there's a lot of uh, things that we can do with uh, this technology. I'll, I'm going to leave you with a picture or movie of some uh, recent experiments. Um, of course, graphene is a simple material that's understood. You've all heard of quasicrystals. They are very, um, uh, very difficult to find. You have to go, you have to go look at, at uh, uh, meteors, for example, that all seem to fall in Russia, and then, or you have to quench condensed materials. And the uh, these are kind of real materials are quite dirty. There's a lot of very interesting quantum properties of quasicrystals. And this is an example of, an, of, of a new quantum material that we can build with uh, very high fidelity, sorry, 
using the same techniques I've just described. And here you can see uh, the structure. The electrons inside this structure have uh, fractal-like properties uh, and a very interesting energy spectrum that actually derives from uh, a higher dimension, from a five-dimensional five crystal that's projected essentially to this two-dimensional crystal. So new experiments now we're doing at these materials is trying to access uh, high, higher dimensional physics that we have no uh, way of accessing directly with, uh, with the dimensions that, we're, yeah, that we live in. So I will, let me stop there and just the, the people and thank the people in red here. On the left are uh, students, some current, some former and postdocs of my group who contributed to the experiments that I showed uh, today and uh, collaborators, uh, some experimental and some theory on the right that also uh, helped with a lot of these experiments. Thank you very much. <laughs>